Hello, Fiona. Welcome to Run Chats with Ron Runs NYC. How are you? I am very well. Thank you, Ron. Kia ora. Um, hello from New Zealand. Our first Kiwi guest. Exciting stuff. It's a privilege. What an honor to be the first Kiwi. Yes. And um, so for our listeners at home, um, Fiona and I are in the Coros Explorers group together. Uh, a band of pretty amazing athletes from around the globe uh, in ultra endurance sports, not just ultra running, but you name an endurance sport, hikers, climbers, mountaineers, alpinists, literally whatever. But we've got some collection of people. And I reached out to Fiona because she's been doing some awesome stuff in the ultra world with her running. And I thought it'd be really fun to have her on. So that's how we connected here today. So Fiona, to give us a little bit of an idea growing up, you know, what it was like down there in New Zealand, where you grew up, how you got involved with sport. Yeah, cool. So I was a, I grew up on a farm, um, farm girl, still got, yeah, that sort of country life through my blood. Um, I guess that's where I, uh, right from the early days, became very fond of being outdoors and exploring exploring the hills and the mountains. Um, I was a, the eldest of three girls actually. Um, and it was quite an isolated farm, but um, very strong community network. Uh, but what it did mean is I went off to, to boarding school at about the age of 13. Uh, so left my, you know, my parents and my younger sisters behind. Um, looking back now, that was probably um, quite tough for a 13 year old. Uh, and that's probably when I first started um, thinking about running. And um, yeah, just I I used it. I just went for 30 minutes in the mornings um, before school. And I started to, I think, um, recognize the, the benefits of, um, of running uh, was when uh, those early school days. Um, yeah, and then went on to university um, here in New Zealand. There's a number of universities that um, you can go to, but New Zealand does feel quite far away at times, um, right down here at the, the bottom of the world, I suppose. Um, so it's quite common for um, young Kiwis to, to go and um, do what we call an OE, overseas experience. Uh, so after my university days, I um, went and uh, traveled a bit of the world, um, probably that's the start of my travel bug. Um, I, I love to travel. Um, in those days, it was quite um, common, I guess, to, to start off in London. So, so that's what I did. Um, and then I explored a bit more of Europe um, and finished up actually in South Korea. And uh, was teaching English uh, to sort of primary school age, age children. It was like an extra cur curricular sort of after school um, uh, program that their parents put them in. And uh, yeah, so that, so that was an interesting year living there. Um, and came back to New Zealand in the early 2000s uh, and uh, Got back into, what did I do then? Um, I was doing some event management at that stage um, and eventually met my now husband in, um, in about 2006 and, um, and then we, we married. And about coming up nine years ago, uh, we had a son. And so my son's turning nine yeah, next year. Uh, not next year, next week, next week. Um, so he's pretty excited about that, obviously. Kids and birthdays. Um, yeah, um, my husband and I, um, coming up 10 years ago, so not, not long before uh, Spike was born, um, we decided to start our own business uh, and we um, opened a, a furniture store. So here in, a, in the town, that, uh, the city that we live in, we live in the capital city of New Zealand, which is Wellington. And we opened a design store um, selling all Kiwi designed furniture and um, things for the home, lighting, rugs, um, soft furnishings and, and hard furnishings. Um, and yeah, and that's been 
it'll be our 10th anniversary in June this year. So that, um, that keeps us pretty busy. Um, it uh, sort of works alongside my my running and my, my training. Um, I've, well, I've made it work. Um, I, I work from a home office and am able to <clears throat> manage the, the marketing and, and communication side of the business um, and from home. And um, that gives me flexibility to train during the day and also with the, you know, within school hours. Um, yeah, so that's the, the general gist of, of who I am, where I've come from. Fabulous. That's great background. And I have to ask, so you're teaching them English, so you had to be giving them the Kiwi your Kiwi English accent, which I love while you're over there <laughs> teaching English. So that's great. I, I would love to hear if those kids got the got your accent going, which would be awesome. Yeah, it would be interesting to know if they did pick much of it up because we found the materials that, you know, they had been using or were, you know, were using um, were very much more along the American lines of pronunciation and things. So, yeah, maybe they did pick some of it up and, and keep it going. That's great. And yeah. um, the sense of travel at that age is just wonderful. Um, I think it's simply one of the most powerful things um, yes. for particularly for kids to to learn. And when I say kids, I'm talking, you know, post-college age or even, you know, teenagers to explore the world and to see other architecture and, and learn about other cultures and, and eat different foods. It's just, it's one of the great great experiences of learning in our lives. And it's something I've had the wonderful privilege of and uh, started taking my son on adventures with me when he was super young. And uh, he has that intrepid spirit and love of travel like I do and like you do. And and what a great way to see the world, not only getting on the planes and flying and going to those places, but putting on your running shoes and getting out to explore. Yeah. What better yeah. way to see, to see a country or a city and learn about it than to get out there and run, right? That's right. Um, I, I mentioned that I sort of started running when I was early high school, but I, I then continued that, that running um, sort of throughout, throughout my life, just very much from a <clears throat> uh, mental and physical well-being stance, nothing competitive. Um, but yeah, part of that was traveling and being able to, or, or wanting to get up early and get on the streets and or if you're more rural get out on the, the rural roads and really um I don't know you just sort of really felt the heart of the city or the or the the country that you the the rural area you were in because you'd see people getting up and the the chickens still running across the road and uh the things that you don't necessarily see if you don't get up until you know your nine or your ten o'clock bus departure if you're if you got if you're traveling um that way so um and the sun rises and obviously the sun sets at the other end of the day um it is really a wonderful way to see the world um on on your own two feet yeah and I've always traveled that way like I I um <clears throat> wherever possible would would be on my own two feet. So if, um, yeah, if it's within reason, um, although it's probably extended as the years go on, but within reason, I would always walk rather than take a bus. Um, so I could, or, or a train. So I could, um, so I could really experience the streets and my surroundings. Yeah. Kindred spirits, are we? Um, because it the world is so different. Um, driving in a car somewhere and being in traffic. I mean, we can only take in so much safely while we're driving a car. And Lord knows we have enough distractions today with our phones beeping and blinking and notifications, you know, chiming in like we were talking about with our Chorus Explorer group, our group uh, messages yeah. that are coming at us fast and furious. But, you know, the only way to really unplug and disconnect is to be out there. And even if it isn't a run, like you said, if it's a walk, you know, if you're out there walking your dog in the woods or on a trail or um, whatever, that's the way we can unplug and connect. Um, and, right. and you also, and, oh, sorry. You no, also, no. Um, you're more, more likely to have those sort of spontaneous um, connections, interactions with with the lo with um with locals and um and other and other tourists as well 
Um, whereas if you're sitting in your your rigid car or whatever, you're yeah, you're you're on your path from A to B, and, you, and you're going to miss out on those sort of intertwinings, um, which is really important if you. Well, it's how I like to travel. I like I like to really like to have those connections. So, yeah. Me too. And it's a great way to learn about where should you eat and, you know, places that you must see, you know, while you're passing through. And um, people are um, so much one to let their guard down when you're out there just running and, you know, out there on your own or maybe with another runner or two, because, you know, you're just, it's just non, non-threatening. It's just, you know, peaceful, casual, um, not a car stopping and rolling down a window where maybe you put somebody off or make them nervous. And, um, I've always found out more about places, just seeing it with my own eyes anyway. And just, wow. Like you said, the sun coming up, the sun going down, how does the church look in this certain light or a building or a school or a hospital? And you just try to imagine what it was like, however many years before. Yeah. Yes. Um, and the other thing that's been, was, is interesting on part of the, the interactions, um, is that being, uh, aware of the culture that's what I learned um, through running and, and, and being out on the streets or wherever the country I'm in, is um, you can of, often, and perhaps more so as a female, um, get sort of sideways glances, um, strange looks. And it made me, I think, through running, made me more aware of ensuring that I was um, respectful of, of the culture. So, you know, in some countries, like, for instance, um, Turkey, that would have mean being a little bit more covered up than I would normally run back here in New Zealand. Um, so, and uh, yeah, and the, oh, and um, Dubai. So I, I ran a little bit in Dubai, although it was just around a park. But even still, just to be respectful for um, the local culture, it was you know it was better to to have your arms covered and, and your legs as much as possible. Yeah. Good stuff. So we love travel and running and travel are certainly they go hand in hand. So when I come to New Zealand, you're going to, you're going to set me up and give me all the best local trail routes and places to go. And, and you're going to keep me away from getting attacked by wild spiders or whatever else I have to worry about down there. Right. (laughs) Or whatever (laughs) is the most deep. Yeah. Yeah. Not too much to be worried about down here. It's, um, Australia that you need to be worried about. They've got all the, the poisonous, dangerous um, reptiles and, and spiders and, you know, animals. Um, here, it's New Zealand's pretty safe. Um, got lots of sheep. <laughs> I think everyone jokes about the amount of sheep we have. More more sheep to um, to, to Kiwis, to New Zealanders. Um, yeah, but we, we have, yeah, a lot of... Um, phenomenal trails and yeah places to explore um so yeah I'll, i'd be more than happy to show you around such a beautiful country and you guys did an amazing job with covid like better than any place else in the world and god bless um i wish other places had figured out what you guys had or learned some of your secrets and um put them into practice but thankful um other parts of the world are coming together finally and, yes. you know, things are opening up. And for us in the ultra and trail community, racing is certainly much more available to us, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, traditional large scale marathons, road marathons that I'm used to running like Boston, New York and Berlin and London and getting on the plane and going to Tokyo and these places. It's just such a big adventure feel of um you know, you feel like a pro athlete in some respects that you're getting on the plane and you're going over to Tokyo and you get to go to this crazy, amazing culture and see this incredible architecture and really friendly people and interesting foods and, you know, look at a place that's so old and and just so interesting. And then, you know, you get out there and you get to race with 50,000 people. It's, it's just a huge adrenaline rush and, and it's awesome being somewhere that's so unique and different, but you know, in the ultra trail world, racing has been continuing to go on. Certainly they've had their share of major races put on hold or postponed or, or you know, canceled outright. But no question, um, ultra and trail has allowed, you know, racing to continue and give that spark for runners. And on my show, I've tried to bring all my marathoning friends over who've never dipped their toe in the ultra ultra waters. Like, come on, man, come on in the water's warm. What are you waiting for? I and mean, this is... 
calling you. So, um, you know, you, um, do you want to, do you want to talk about, forget how you got into ultra first, but just running. Yeah. I know you, you know, in your primary years, like schooling years, you enjoyed it, but you know, when did you really get involved and first figure out like, Hey, this could be something I might be good at. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to put some more time in here and energy here and see what I can do. Yeah, no, cool. Um, so yeah, really, yes, the point in my life that the turning point, I suppose, with my running would, would be after the birth of my son. So um, he was born in 2012. Uh, and then I had just had a break from running because I actually, co uh, my pregnancy coincided with a bit of a, um, a back strain. Uh, which I actually did in a um, Bikram yoga gym, <laughs> but I was running at the time. I was doing both um, yoga and running. And um, so I took a break. I, I took a break from the running for about nine or 10 months. But then as soon as he was born, uh, I purchased a buggy that had nice big wheels and that, you know, I could securely pop him in and just started running it again at every opportunity, basically. Uh, I'd do the grocery shopping and go and visit friends and go down to our, you know, our, our shop, our showroom and visit my husband. Um, and yeah, really, it really helped me build up uh, my running again, my, my endurance. Um, as he got heavier and having to push him up the hills, I got a bit of, you know, strength training in as well. Uh, and then once I was feeling a bit more confident, um, I started uh, doing into another ultra so he was probably coming up about um two by that stage and it was a 60k event uh and i came second female and and it was under i ran under six hours so and so for me coming back from pregnancy and you know having that break from running it it felt um it felt good it felt like a pretty respectable um result and um from there i I went on and um, started entering, you know, some more um, ultras, and I always came back to um, the Tarawera Ultra Marathon. Um, you see, I've got a little a T-shirt on here. Repre <laughs> representing Tarawera, yeah. yes. It's, um, it it uh, the Tarawera, which runs in the North Island, so um, further north of where I live, and around the Rotorua Lakes, um, is. Yeah, basically, it's probably New Zealand's most well-known um, ultra marathon, and partly because of its connection with the Ultra Trail World Tour. Um, and it was my first one-day ultra event that I did back in, oh, it was before Spike was born, so 2011, um, uh, I, I ran that. I actually ran it with a friend. And we'd never run a, done any running together, but um, we lined up on the start line and we said, just let's just see how our days go. Let's not make a commitment to stay together. We'll, we'll just, just go with how we're feeling um, individually. Uh, but we took off and it was just one of those magic days where uh, we were just having the best time. It was like a party on the trails. We, we made the most, totally made the most of every aid station and Tarawera is renowned for its well-laden aid stations. Everything from your savouries to your sweets and your fruits and every type of drink you can imagine. And so we, <laughs> we just used it as a, a sort of a running buffet we had. And we were signed up for the 60K but we were just having so much fun and it was the most glorious sunny day and no wind and that we waved goodbye to our, they would say our boyfriends at the time and <laughs> said, meet us at the, at the 85. So, cause that, there was an 85 K option and a hundred K option, which finished at the same finish line. Whereas the 60 K finished short and we didn't want to finish there cause it, it was like a smaller group of people. And we just thought, right, we want to go on to, to the main finish line. So, so we did. So we went on and, and completed the 85K that year. And so for me, Tarawera is sort of where it all started. And um, I've been, I've just run my 10th um, of uh, Tarawera ultra marathon event um, just uh, four weeks ago, I think it was. Um, 
And yes, we're obviously in COVID times, we're feeling very um, grateful to be able to have these events, to be able to participate with um, fairly limited restrictions. Uh, I know I'm seeing the um, some of the stuff that comes through social media and, and friends and things who are, are racing in places like Europe and, and the States, but they haven't, you know, you're having to wear masks and that we're, we've, been so lucky really, so privileged to have, um, well, to be a, an island nation uh, that that is a, you know, um, is, is particularly helpful, but then to, to um, have very strong leadership, um, wise leadership, uh, our Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, um, is doing, has done an amazing job to, to keep us um, fairly uh, COVID free. So, yeah, so Tara, we're a, um, went ahead and uh, it was another fabulous event. Um, yeah, I ran the 100 miler uh, this year. It was my second time running the 100 miler. Uh, I did that, the inaugural one, so in, back in um, 2018, and it was an exceedingly wet year. So we've had some very extremes of, we can have very extremes of weather. And even though it's held in sort of in February, which is, should be our summer, uh, we can have some cyclones and things that come through. And, and that year we did, we had a, a really wet year. And um, the Myla course connects in with where the 100 Ks have already run. So we, we sort of cross over. And by the time we got round to that part of the course, um, the trail was so messed up. It was um, very boggy, very yeah, very muddy, almost like you know, like a pig pen <laughs> trudging through. It was very slow going, um, and so although my day started off well, um, I had an almighty crash. Uh, you know, basically hit a wall coming with only about 25 or 30 k to go and it became a, re a real struggle to finish um, and so uh, I did finish. Uh, the, one of the motivating factors was uh, the, the punamu that you receive when you, when you finish the Myla um, course which is very unique to New Zealand. So punamu is, um, is greenstone. Um, I've got my one from this year around my neck so this is actually the second one that I've been awarded. Um, so at the time in 2018, um, yeah, knowing that that I would be awarded a, um, a Punamu Toki uh, for, it's a symbol of uh, courage and strength um, at the finish line. That was, yeah, that, that really um, kept me going. Yeah, and uh, I had a pacer thankfully at that, that, that stage of the race. So. From a safety point of view, um, he was there with me, uh, but he, yeah, I, I, he was so patient. I don't know how um, Jason managed to, to stick with me because <laughs> it was very slow going. Um, so then when I went back this year, I, um, I felt like I had very much had unfinished business um, going back, yeah, going back into it this year, and because I know from uh, past races, I, um, other races I've done. It was my fourth 100 mile event, um, plus I've done a lot of other uh, long distance stuff. So I, I know what I'm capable of. So I, yeah, I, I went into it um, with some high expectations as, as around time and um, was very happy to come out the other end of it, um, meeting some of those goals. So yeah, and having a, a, a far happier um, experience than I had in 2018. We had a nice dry, um, yeah, a really a dry hard course this year. So no, not we didn't have to contend with mud at all. Um, and really hot, but I've, I've run in some hot conditions before as well. Um, I've actually been at Western States twice. Uh, so I think most people know that uh, Western States is a hot course. <laughs> Even on a cool year, I think it's still, well, for Kiwis, it's still a hot course on a cool year. 
Yeah, the, the temperature ranges are so dramatic at yeah. Western. You know, you see it could be 100, 105, 110 in certain parts, but then there's like crazy amounts of snow on the upper parts of the course. And it just blows my mind um, yeah. following that race and seeing that. Um, just the extremes and, um, you know, the, the length of time you're out there, you know, the, the, the temperature swings and of course, ma trying to manage all that with your body and, and your fueling and, and to try to get it right. But we have a lot to backtrack on because you covered so many, so many <laughs> interesting, no, no, it's okay. Let's just see if my 60 year old memory works well. This is going to be my first test of the day. So I want to go all the way back to you started running in the stroller with Spike, which I just love. Um, Cause anytime I get a mom on here, there's one of the very first questions I always have is because um, my ex was a terrific runner and we were both running with our son in the jog stroller all the time from the time he was, you know, weight enough and was safe enough for him to be out there and running on those Hills with him. I mean, I could still hear his belly laps in my ear. I mean, the, the, the joy, his feet flopping up and down and just, I, I just some of the happiest moments that I could remember. Um, and after we got divorced and, you know, started to live somewhat separate lives, although we've always remained super close and done so many of our co-parenting things together, even though we're not living together anymore. Um, I always had those moments with him in Central Park doing, you know, 12, 14 mile runs up and down those hills that you talk about. What a great strength training. And you're talking about running to the grocery store and buying groceries. I love it. You're, you're, you're going to the furniture store. You're going, it's Adventureville and Spike is there with you. So this is like mommy, son time and yeah. it's fitness time and you're getting back in shape and you're getting strong. And I just think that's awesome. And I don't want to lose that piece because I think it's wonderful for, you know, there'll be moms out there that, you know, maybe want to just even get a little time alone and even not be with their sons or daughters. And they feel like they just want to be alone and run alone without another mom or, or a man or anybody in sight and just, uh, you know, tune out from the world. But I just love, um, I love the whole stroller connection thing. And um, there's some, so many happy hours that I remember. And, you know, then my son, became a runner himself. And, you know, I hope he'll be able to have that kind of experience like you had with Spike and I had with him. Um, it's wonderful. And then, you know, for your first Tarawera, um, you know, you're supposed to run 60K and you go to 85. I think that's the best. I don't know anybody. I, that's just the kind of thing I would want to do. I would love to say I did it. I didn't do it. I just absolutely love that. You know, you're out there and the day's coming to you. And it's one of those things that I try to pass along to people all the time because you get a little older, you, you, you're a little more willing to give advice. It doesn't mean anybody's going to listen to you, but what the hell, man? You can put it out there, man. Hey, I'm experienced. When I grew up, when elder people talked, it had reverence and I'd be like, okay, my grandfather's telling me something I should listen or an older teacher or someone I respected or had reverence for. And, you know, you never know when your day is going to come. You just don't know. And it could be a day when you have the least expectation, when you've had no preparation whatsoever, but you just feel good on that day. And right. way too many of us want to go through a perfect cycle of training, a perfect buildup in training and hit these mileage milestones and get these long runs in at a certain pace and have so many hours on our feet so that we feel like when we get to Tarawara for the 100 miler or Western States or some other amazing venue that we're running in, that we've done all the work, we've checked all the boxes, but here's one thing that we've all learned along the way, Fiona. You don't know what is in store for you on that day, despite how great your training was or how shitty your training was or how unprepared you were, you might have the best day out there with your friend because you had no pressure on yourselves. That's right. no you, didn't, you didn't even yeah. agree to stay together. You're just like, yeah. hey, whatever. You know, we're going to have fun. We're going to enjoy ourselves. You're smiling. I'm smiling because the pressure's off. You're just out there enjoying the moment, the sunshine, the aid stations. And by the way, if you haven't done an ultra yet, I don't know what you're waiting for because gummy bears, jelly beans, candy, <laughs> the best drinks, the best snacks. I mean, and the best people, these people yeah. are like, you want to adopt them as family members, man. They want to take you in. They want to make you smile, make you laugh. And they'll give you anything, including the shirt off your back to help you keep you moving down the road and keep you running. So it's great stuff. And then, so your first tower, you finish with your friend, you go 85 K and then your the next stage up was 100 miler. So what was your first year you competed the Tarawara 100 miler? What was what year was that? 
so yeah, the hundred miler was in in twenty not till twenty eighteen. That was when they first started doing a hundred miler. So it was it was quite new. Um, well, it is new compared to the other distances. So um, it's when Tarawera started. Um, it they just had the sixty k, eighty five k, and a hundred k. So after doing the eighty five k in two thousand and eleven. I then went off and you know, had spike and had a bit of a break and then needed to, to build up my endurance again. Uh, so I went back to Tarawera in 2014. Um, and that was that was another wet year. So I'd signed up to do 100 Ks that year, um, but it was so wet. There was a, a cyclone coming through called Cyclone Lucy. And so about nine o'clock the night before the race, the um, the race directors actually had to uh, change the course and so we had an alternative course and it was cut down to around 75 kilometers um, and it was really the first year 2015 that Tarawera started to have some international athletes coming or oh, maybe the year before as well but I wasn't there actually that year so 2013 um, but I I had a I had a reasonable race and I I came in seventh that year, um in the seven it was seventy five k's, and I guess at that point I was yeah from the races that I was doing I I was starting to notice that I was a bit more at the pointy end um I I didn't have a coach um in those days I was just going out and basically running still running at every opportunity so. Uh, still with the buggy, um, I was, let me think, yes, I was still even breastfeeding at that stage, so um, going back to Spike and the buggy, I was, um, I breastfed him for the first sort of three years of his life, um, and so, you know, sometimes that meant stopping on the side of the, the road <laughs> um, for a quick feed if he was getting extra um, scratchy. <laughs> In the buggy uh, but I was fortunate actually most of the time when I put him in the buggy he would fall asleep in the early days I would you know make sure I coincided it with his sleep time um, then as he as he got older it didn't always work out so well but um, yeah it was it was a good way to to get him to to nap um, and yes where did I get to losing track oh yeah so I was still breastfeeding him at, in 2014 when I um when I did the the 70 well, it was 75 k's that year at Tarawera, and then in 2015 uh, was I finally got to do uh, to to run the full 100 k. So it was my uh, my first time running 100 kilometers, um, and it was a, a point to point course. So we started in Rotorua and we ran through all the lakes and um, through the forest to Kaurau and it was still one of my most exhilarating uh, finishes to a race. Um, I was coming, I was in the top 10, but I, I definitely wasn't in the top five with about uh, five, 10 kilometers to go. And uh, my crew alluded me to the fact that, you know, I was, was doing well and that the, there were a couple of girls not far ahead of me. So um, that was pretty exciting. And I discovered that I was very motivated by that. Um, and I had a pacer with me and um, she, she was um, very encouraging as well. So that, that really helped. We really worked well together. Um, and as we came into the five kilometers to go, um, I overtook one of the girls, which um, moved me up into fifth place. Yeah, into fifth place. And as I could see the, the aid station ahead of me and I was like, I said to Mel, we're not stopping. <laughs> so I ran straight through that, um, that last aid station with five Ks to go. And as, I was, as we ran past that last aid station, we passed another a woman who was actually just having a little bit of trouble. Um, and so then I'd moved up into fourth place all of a sudden. So it all happened re really quickly. Um, and it really gets your, well, gets my adrenaline going um, if you're in that situation. Um, but I knew 
that I still needed to keep pushing. I could, you know, the particularly not the girl who had been struggling a little bit, but Kovo who who was still running well. Um, I knew that she quite, you know, could quite potentially try and chase me down again, um, which she did. Uh, and in the end, it came down to uh, seconds. I, I I think it was only like two or three second difference um, in the end that she caught back up to me. So I um, I, I came across in fourth, um, and yeah, so that was pretty exciting and, and an exhilarating finish. Um, so that was 2015. Yeah. So top five, and your first real opportunity to kind of learn just how competitive you were in a real race experience, as opposed to running in the buggy with Spike and, you know, just yeah. trying to finish a distance with a friend, like you ran through an aid station. I just love it. I love hearing stuff like that because we don't know until we get put into a situation like that, how we're going to respond or react. And it doesn't mean that you're not a badass if you go to the aid station and you take your drink. It just, we don't yeah. know. And no. it's very fun. And one of the things I enjoy the most about the show is the chance to explore the whys, like why we make those decisions. And when we are in those decision, decision making points in a race, like how we react and yeah. what, what makes us or what shaped us to react that way. So I think we learn a, you're very competitive. Um, you know, you are super, super competitive when you're in the fire and you may not have known that about yourself, you know, cause it's not like you were, you know, running in high school and college on a scholarship and used to racing people head to head. I mean, running has come to you in a different phase of your life. And yeah. you know, now here all of a sudden, you know, you have this chance to get into the top five, which is a huge, huge deal. And, you know, you're making decisions on the fly. So where did, what did you learn about yourself in that moment? And where do you think your competitive competitiveness comes from? Yeah. So as you've just said, um, it's not many situations in life where where you are um, put in that sort of pressure cooker environment. Um, so, yeah, so so to learn that about myself, about how um, competitive I am, if it really comes down to the crunch, was, I guess, really motivating and inspiring for me. Um, and it's become actually probably a bit of a trademark <laughs> now that I, if I look back at, particularly Tarawera, if I look back at my history at, at Tarawera, um, I've often, probably more more times than not, um, run through that last aid station because I, I don't know what I do, but I, I seem to come into these situations where I'm really close to the, the, the person in front of me or, or the person, someone just behind me. So um, I just, I, I save a little bit for the end and, um, and then I, I really push, I really, really push that last sort of five to 10 Ks, whatever, it, yeah, whatever it is. Um, thankfully, I think thankfully for me, uh, the Tarawera course works quite nicely because my, my strong, uh, the terrain that I'm, I'm strongest on is, is the flat and um, it, it finishes, Tarawera finishes with, with a flat portion. So um, that, that works really well for me. Um, just going back to, where I think I get some of that um, that drive from, I, I'd have to credit it to my mother. Um, she was always on the go, um, always yeah, was organising every everyone and everything, and uh, had a a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. Uh, I remember, yeah, I remember in the early days here saying, you know. Okay, plan A is not working, so I'm moving to plan B. I'm going to ring this person. And and so I think I can credit some of the, I guess, some of the organization that's required to run an ultra um, to the skills that I learned from her, the organizational skills. Because, you know, as you, you, you're aware, you, you've run ultras yourself. You, you know, it, it doesn't come down to chance. You do need to, there's, there's a bit of planning and preparation that goes into it, um, right back from the, the training, the, the dedication that you need to put into the, the training, but then also once it gets closer to the event, um, the logistics side of it. So can definitely um, credit that to my mother. Yeah. She's um, sadly not with, with us anymore. Um, she passed away uh, the end of 2005. So I just turned 30. 
um, from from breast cancer. Um, and yeah, as you as you mentioned, my running in those days was was very very much um, just for still for, for well being. And I came later to into the, into competitive running. So it wasn't until I was sort of heading towards forty that that I um, decided to to give it a go. I, I guess give it a crack. Um, and and uh, yeah, approach races more competitively. I love I love the insight um, sharing learn I and mean, your learnings about yourself. Um, yeah. You learn that on the fly. Um, yeah. There's no way to know. There's just no way to know how we're going to react to a situation like that. Um, it could be the man in the moon running by you. It doesn't have to be another woman competitor. It could be anybody. I mean, it just, we just don't know until we're in that spot where it's like, hold on a minute. No, nobody's going by me right now. I'm not letting this happen. Or it's yeah. like, okay, I'm going to dial myself back in here, get resettled. And I'm going to just ease off the throttle here a little bit. And then I'm going to gather myself and I'm going to come. And we don't hunt them down. Like we don't, we don't know. Um, we might need fuel. We might need a salt tablet. We don't know. And one thing's for sure, he gave a uh, big love to your mom and God bless her. God rest her up there, wherever she is. You know, she's watching over you while you're out there running for sure. And she's proud. Yeah. Um, but um, I think one of the, one of the super cool things about it is um, ultras teach us about life and problem solving, man. This is not, this is not some race where you go to the track and you run four laps and it's over and Hey, the mile could be the most brutal race in the world, but in ultra, I mean, we're managing everything. We've got to have our, our levels, right. Our potassium levels, right. And, and get enough fluids in or get some solids down and, and get enough calories in and, and just be running in the right shoes, have the right layers of clothing on. I mean, there's so many things, temperature changes that are so dramatic at like Western states. I mean, you know, you could be doing complete clothing changes, shoe changes, sock changes, all the above. And you, which I loved, you credited your pacer that one year, like picking the right person who's going to meet you out there is, I don't know that there could be anything more important other than maybe being able to have a crew that's super that gets you and understands who Fiona is, or if she's in a dark spot to just leave her be, or no, 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 man, we got to get her out of this spot. And here's how we're going to deal with it. Because I still remember watching a Billy Yang film on YouTube. One of my favorites, it's like the why 100 or why Leadville 100, whatever. It's just really exploring like why. And I remember the dark places that he was in that race, man. And it was filmed and it was just like, no, I'm, I'm done. I, I, no way I'm not going anymore. And they're talking to him. And I just loved it. I loved how transparent that all came across because there's no ultra runner in the world. I don't care if you've won Western States or Tarawa or any other great ultra that's out there, UTMB. There's no ultra run in the world that hasn't been in one of those dark spots, if not once, more than once, maybe even many times in any race that's over 50 miles because things are going to happen. And some of them are very physical. Okay. Some of them are nutritional and some of them are just mental where you just get into a bad spot. So yeah. for you, when those things happen, you know, whether it be physical, whether it be mental, whether it be equipment or gear, blisters, like how, what are some things that you do personally that have worked for you? Because obviously you're, you're having great success. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the, the more of these events that I do, these race ultras I do, um, I guess you just take a, a snippet from each one and it, um, you, it all builds your confidence and your your experience and you you um, just intuitively remember those experiences. Um, so you, you feel your mind and your body feels like they've been there before. You've you've um, you know you've done a longer distance or you've pushed through a harder situation. So I draw on those experiences and more and more as you know as my experiences grow. Um, and most of that is around patience. I think with ultra running is, is yes, we are all going to experience those real lows and really difficult situations, whether, as you said, it's, it's one element or, or a combination of elements, but it's just reminding yourself that it will pass. Um, it, it definitely, it always passes. Um, if you just, 
keep putting one foot in front of the other. If you just keep moving forward, it will pass. Like that year, the 2018 miler that I did, I was literally walking three steps uh, and then having to sit down. I was feeling so weak and just delirious out of, out of it. Wasn't there at all. Um, and I was having to sit down and rest. And we were only, I don't know, maybe five kilometers from the aid station, but it felt like a hundred kilometers, like that I was never going to get there. But um, I, I just did things. I think you've got to think on the fly a little bit as well. Like um, even if you're, you're so out of it, but you know, I, because I'd slowed down so much, my body temperature had dropped. So putting on if all my compulsory gear, all that mandatory gear here in New Zealand, we're very strict on um, compulsory mandatory gear. I know um, in the States, perhaps not so much, well, maybe some races do, but like the lights of Western States, there was nothing mandatory to carry. Um, but here in New Zealand, we carry everything, jackets, long sleeve thermals, hats, uh, gloves. Yeah, and so putting all that on and um, eating everything that I had in my pack and then just just moving forward, just, just three steps at a time, having a rest. Um, by the time I actually got to that aid station where my crew had been waiting so patiently for me for hours, <laughs> um, I was feeling more with it. I, um, I definitely um, had, had come out of my, my deep hole. And, um, and then thinking once you get into that, into the aid station and where there are resources and, and um, more gear and more food, it's just making sure that you then um, utilize what's there and and having a full change of clothing, a change of shoes and socks, um, eating some some more food, different food, perhaps that you don't, you wouldn't normally, you know, um, typically yourself have for a race. All those things will then help you get on to the onto the next stage. And I and I guess not not trying to overthink it too much. Like um, I. I guess going back to the start of a race before before a race, I keep things pretty simple. I try not to over overcomplicate um, my nutrition and and my plan. Um, I I use Tailwind um, as my baseline, and have been for quite a number of years. Um, so that provides a, um, basically all the carbohydrates and electrolytes that I that I do need. Um, I've run. Actually, I've run 24 hours, um, a 24 hour track event uh, at the World Champs in 2019. Um, I just ran on Tailwind. And um, so I know that I can I can last for that long. Um, anything longer, I'd pro probably, um, yeah, I, I would start using more real food and, and and an example of that is, is last year I did my first uh, backyard ultra format. So that's uh, like a last person person standing format, um, running a 6.7 kilometer loop, and you had to do it within the hour. And any extra time that you had, you could uh, use for rest and um, replenishing your gear and. Uh, changing your shoes and things like that. Sleeping, if you if you could during the night, because it just you know, it keeps going um, through the day and night. And um, through that, I um, definitely used real food. So again, tailwind is the base, but but definitely um, bringing in a, a lot more real food into into that nutrition plan. Um, yeah. So I have two questions on your. Okay on your 24 hour on the track, yes. all tailwind nutrition. So just the drinks, just the fluids, no, you're getting all your carbohydrates, calories from, from the drinks, right? 24 yeah. hours run. So no gels, no solid food, just 24 hours on the track. Not in that, not that one. No. Um, so I've run 24 hours on the track twice. Um, in 2018, uh, was my first go at it. Um, up until then, so yeah, I guess the first sort of four or five years of, of ultra running, um, I was predominantly ultra trail and um, mostly targeting the ultra trail world tour events. 
So I traveled quite extensively around the world um, to different races. Um, and that side of it, as, as you learned earlier, I'm, I love travel like yourself. And so that really appealed and, and kept me mo motivated. But then at the end of 2018, I was approached um, by Athletics New Zealand to see if I would be interested in representing New Zealand at the um, Asia Oceania Champs. And it was being um, held in uh, Taiwan. And again, so again, travel. <laughs> I got to travel, so <laughs> that was like, yes, count I'll me go. in. No, I did. I did question it for a little bit. Um, I well, I I don't know if I questioned it so much. I think perhaps my husband questioned it more. He was like, "What? You're going to run round and round in circles on a track? That doesn't sound very exciting. Like how boring." And that was the kind of comments. Not that I just got from him, but from a lot of people. They were like, "Why would you want to do that?" And yeah. So anyway, I went off and I, I went off and did it. And um, the first time is always anything, isn't it? The first time is a very much a learning experience. Uh, but I did I did use Tailwind as a good base for that. But also um, I had a few other things. So I had um, I used Spring Energy. Um, so that's comes in a gel format, but um, it's an American product. Uh, but it's very natural. It's it's a hundred percent um, natural real food, and it's a, a rice base with lots of other goodies in it. Um, your almond butters and your peanut butters and banana and different fruits and things. So yeah, I, I did supplement with that as well. Um, and then when I was falling apart in the middle of the night, I was really struggled with the the early hours of the morning when it's pitch black. It had been a really hot day um, in Taiwan in Taipei that day. So um, the evening, yeah, I, I was struggling a bit. So I reached out for a bit more uh, real food at that stage, a bit of broth and, um, and some rice. Um, but then, yeah, then the following year when I went to, um, to Albi in France for the World Champs, I had a plan actually to, to use more real food. I was going to try and like, you know, around dinner time, perhaps have some mashed potato, I um, follow the likes of Courtney DeWalter and um, yes. she, she's been over here and I've, had, I've been fortunate to, to meet her and race with her here um, for the Tarawera event a couple of years ago back. Um, and so following her and, and reading what, what she uses for her longer events. That's her so favorite. I potato that, that year at the, at, in France, but I don't know. I just felt like I was balanced like the tailwind was doing what it was supposed to be doing and I didn't want to try and bring something else into the mix in case it it, it flipped a switch and threw me off sideways I mean there were a lot of people that were falling apart again it was a hot we'd had a hot day um and so yes yeah, so I just kept on tracking with with the tailwind and um and I was pleased I actually managed to to get through that whole night portion without having to to, to stop to um, that time. So that when I was in um, Taiwan, I actually ended up in the med tent, medical tent um, for about 20 minutes on a stretcher. I, I was weaving all over the tracks. Like a, they were very strict. The IAU is very strict on all the rules and they have people out there with like clipboards, um, you know, penalizing and mark if you go if you go into the wrong lane and things. And um, I, with the sleep deprivation, I was starting to weave a bit <laughs> on my lane. And one of my teammates, Andrew, came along and said, Fee, I think, I think we should go around to the medical tent. So he sort of veered me around there, steered me around there. And um, I, they checked me out and yeah, no issues or anything, but they just said, right, lie down for 20 minutes. But so then, yeah, when I went to France, having as I was speaking about before, having the experience of that, I was able to draw on how I, how I felt the year pr prior and know this, feel the signs, the signals. And so, you know, started to, to just walk a few stretches a little bit earlier in the, in the piece, I guess. And so then I managed to get through the night without having to stop um, in France. So, so that was, yeah, that was really satisfying and exciting because I was then able to um, increase my kilometres um, because I hadn't had that um, had that nap. Um, I was moving forward 
for the whole 24 hours. Um, and yeah, I think I added about eight kilometers to, to my PB. Which uh, actually, it was, um, you know, you, you go, you start usually about nine o'clock in the morning and then you go through the whole night and then obviously finishes at, at nine o'clock the next day. Um, so as the sun comes up, it's quite uplifting. Um, it, you, you sort of wake up a bit. Um, and then it's amazing as, as you get within that sort of probably the last hour, like that, that, I don't know, witching hour, whatever you want to call it, you just find this energy that, you know, an hour or so earlier, you just thought you were done, like, you, you know, you had enough, you just wanted it to finish. But um, with, you know, even, with, with even five or 10 minutes to go, you, this, your energy returns and, and it comes from nowhere. And I, I don't know how, but because you're pretty tired and I um, somehow managed to do the calculation in my head uh, about half, how much time I had left and what pace I needed to run to, to achieve over 210 kilometers. And I, some, a, a, a switch flicked and I realized that I could actually get over 210 kilometers if I really put my foot down. So, so I did. <laughs> Coming back to that sort of fighting spirit in the last, you know, in the last um, five Ks or five, five minutes or whatever it is. So I had, I had the New Zealand flag by that. We usually do the last few laps with our country's flag around our shoulders. And so I had that in my hands. I don't know what I was doing. I, I, have, I need to find some video footage because yes, yeah, so I was holding onto this flag and then just totally putting my foot down to, um, to reach that 210 Ks. And, uh, and I did as the, the horn hooted or the whistle blew. I can't remember what it was. I, um, I put my foot down and they measured it up and it was 210.134 kilometers. So yeah, I was pretty pleased. <laughs> <laughs> that that is completely insane, amazing, two hundred and ten kilometers. So that's like one hundred and twenty six miles or something like that. I think if my kilometers to miles is correct, oh, I hope so. Two hundred yeah. times six is one hundred and twenty, and then another ten is six point two. So yeah, like one hundred and twenty, like one hundred twenty six something miles. That's crazy. That's unbelievable. <laughs> totally, absolutely amazing. Unbelievable. What an experience. And uh, hearing you we talk about weaving on the track. I mean, I have heard so many stories from friends who've done not just hundred milers, but stage races or other things where they're running in the middle of the night. And I mean, we've got races here, which I'm sure you have in New Zealand too, like the Moab 240 and these other stage races where, you know, you're running, you know, not just a you know, crazy amount of mileage, but it's a crazy amount every day. So it's one thing that it's a crazy amount of mileage, but it's every day, you know, repetitively. And it's those temperature changes. That's the stuff that gets you. You talked yes. about when you got really cold. Yeah. I did my 60 mile fundraiser on my 60th birthday for Tommy Ribs. The run was as cold as it was, as brutal a day as it was. I was just sailing along and making it through. And there's no way you're ever making it through anything long without something happening, especially when you don't have aid yeah. stations, you don't have people, it's not a race. And at like 48 miles to go, I just started shivering and body temperature just dropped and it had been freezing all day. And I started at seven in the morning and it's now at night, the temperature is below zero wind chill and I have the same clothes on. And my friend has a Jeep and he's like, well, come on in the Jeep and you'll get warm. And I didn't see I didn't sit in his Jeep for more than like 10 seconds. And maybe it was just like my butt being up on the seat, like a high seat. Oh, my calves just both started twitching. Like Robin's like, he's like, where are you going to go? I'm out of here. He had a bag of potato chips. I just grabbed a massive handful. I just chomped on him. I, he had a bottle of Coke there. I chugged as much Coke as I could get down and burped all over myself. And then I went to a corner <laughs> store because it was New York City where I was. And I just grabbed a hot cup of coffee because I was shivering. I was freezing. And the hot coffee, you talked about the temperature change and having some soup. Yeah. The hot coffee, like it just, my hands got warm from the hot coffee and all the sugar in the coffee got the sugar back in me and the, the yeah. salt and, soda. and I had to walk about a half a mile in there, a mile. And then I started running and the last 11 or 12 miles were my fastest and I finished, but you talked yeah. about those low points. Like people don't, they, they won't believe it. It doesn't sound real. You could be like, there's no way I could go another step and you'd be yeah. 40 miles into a hundred mile run. And then not only do you do it, you 
you run some of your best miles at the end, like you talked about. You're yeah. in the last hour of a 24-hour run, but somehow your brain now says, wait a minute, we only have one more hour to go, or we have 48 minutes yeah. to go. And all of a sudden, when it's 20 minutes to go, all of a sudden, somehow our body can find another level that didn't yeah. seem possible, which is all David Goggins, which is why I love Goggins. Um, yeah. I just think it's so cool. So you're learning all these secrets about yourself between running on the track, running in ultras, racing against other super competitive women on national teams. It's it's super inspiring, man, and great stuff. And um, yeah, Courtney, she's all about the mashed potatoes, man. I, yeah. I love following her. When I read that, I'm like, oh, I I have to love her now because who doesn't love mashed potatoes? I mean, come on, you can't you can't go wrong with that. But the thing is, as you know, you got to figure out what works for you. You know, what works for Courtney doesn't necessarily work for Fiona or Ron. It's it's all a matter of testing it out and practicing it, and then on race day. If something doesn't work, then what do we have to do? We got to come up with the plan B like your mom or plan C, right? I mean, that's that's what it is. It's problem solving, troubleshooting on the fly. That's right. It's um, it's so individual. Like, I mean, I, I have quite a few, you know, questions come in from various people over the years and you know, asking me what I use for nutrition and what you do in this situation. But yeah, it's 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 so individual and um, it, it just comes from testing. But uh, the other side of it is, yes, it's a, a physical sport and, you know, you need to have that um, foundation, the, the running foundation, the endurance built up, but um, it's also very a very mental sport. Uh, and I've learned to, um, over the years that our mind is just honestly the most, the most powerful of the tools that we've got. And to um to really uh be confident in its power and and to use it and um to get through these long distances or long hours um you just you just need to use your mind you need to um sometimes you need to trick it <laughs> you, so what's what's something you've done to trick your mind or do you have any favorite mantras like what what are some things that you've done in the mental area to help you yeah um I have started using uh, mantras for for my races, um, and I think the first time I, I used mantras was when I ran Western States in 2017. It was the the first time um, that I was there, and then I went back again in 2018. I was it was my first hundred miler um, Western States, and it came I guess just to backtrack a little bit how I got there is. Um, it came off the back of uh, my win at Tarawera 100K in 2016. So after my exhilarating finish in 2015, I went back the following year to run the 100K again. And um, I surprised myself <laughs> and I get and, and those nearest to me uh, and crossed the finish line first. Uh, and from that, it really launched, I guess, launched my career, uh, my ultra running career and launched me onto the, the ultra trail world tour circuit. Um, and part with Western States being part of that, I was um, fortunate to be offered it like a guaranteed spot at, at Western States the following year. So that's that's sort of how I ended up getting there. Um, and I surprised myself that year and, and doing the um, 100 miles for the first time, I um, placed in, um, in the top 10 females. I actually came across the line in fifth. And so from that um, was, yeah, able to go back the following year, 2018. But anyway, so Western States was the first year that I, um, well, the first time I sort of really started thinking about mantras and, and using them. And um, one of the one of the ones that I carried that year was um, be at one with the course, and it was something that actually one of the local guys that had said to me prior to the race. Um, he'd run it, run it before, and I was fortunate to be able to go out and um, be in the area for the couple of I think it was a couple of weeks before um, before I started running before the race. And so met a lot of um, local runners and things. So that was 
a piece of advice I got. Um, I always always carry the mantra um, since I've been carrying mantras of um, make mum proud because it really helps me to think about her when I'm out there and um, yeah, to know that she's, I know that she's watching and um, it really lifts me. I, I probably speak with her. I always speak with her every race and it's probably when I'm feeling a bit low um, and I, yeah, then try and draw on her energy. Um, I've had, I think I've had one, I mean, I've had, I've had a few sort of um, hallucination moments, but more of a euphoric moment, uh, speaking with my mother, uh, coming to the end of, of one of the Tarawera's and yeah, I could just, it was along quite a nice long flatter road section and I could just really, I don't know, I could feel her underneath me. It was kind of crazy and I, I am, um, it's this is yeah it's probably going to sound a bit crazy but Mel who's my 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 pacer who, who's paced me a number of times at Tarawera um I spoke with her about it at the time like I mentioned it to her and uh yeah it was just one of those very special moments um she could feel it as well um anyway enough said I can leave it there <laughs> no I I absolutely love that you shared that because I think yeah. once you get out um to the hundred mile distance specifically, not saying it couldn't happen at a hundred K, but it seems to be much more common in a hundred mile race or even longer where people have had, you know, multitudes of experiences that have been talked about on uh, running podcasts and ultra podcasts. Yeah. And I just yeah. think it's one of the amazing and most interesting things about our sport. And it's one of the yeah. beautiful things about it, because look, at some point when we hit these dark sports, dark spots. We turn inward, we turn outward, we pray, we talk to people who aren't with us anymore or other people. Um, whatever we do to try, it's it's that simple thing in the that you mentioned before. And it's my mom's motto in life. It's put one foot in front of the other. It's what she's always said. And you know, in my first 50 miler, when I struggled, I turned it into a song and it was the worst song in the world because I can't sing for shit. But I just literally didn't care if anyone else was near me or if they came up on me. I wasn't worried about embarrassing myself or anything else because I was honoring my mom. It was how she's shown me how to be tough in life and, you know, beat breast cancer and have lymphoma for 25 years and, and take on COVID and just push that right aside and almost 89 years old. So she just um, lived a life of a selfless life of always caring about her kids and putting us all first and the grandkids first. And then her work colleagues for 42 years where she worked, where they're trying to get her to come back at 89 years old. So, um, and she's this tiny little Irish lady. So um, when people picture strength and they always want to think of like the rock or some you know, Herculean, strong, muscular guy. Um, it can be a small woman. It can be a small child. It can be, it doesn't have to be a big physical presence. Strength is what we believe, you know, strength yeah. is. So we tap into those moments and, you know, singing some stupid, crazy song yeah. or channeling a mantra. But I want to take on a hundred because I'm, you know, I want to have an experience like that. I want to see what that experience will be for me. You know, that Billy talked about in his, um, YouTube movie that he made, you know, like why his hundred in Leadville when he was losing it and coming apart and saying he couldn't go any further. And, you know, he had, he wasn't even barely halfway through, I think when he was first having those issues and he had different people on his team trying to talk him off the plank, if you will. So those experiences. Yeah, thank, thankfully, every time you run one of these races, these ultras, even, even if it's not just, but you know, a 50 K ultra as opposed to a hundred miles or, or longer, um, every experience is, um, is so different and um, you get something more out of it each, each time. Um, and yeah, thankfully, thankfully it's, it's always different. And I, you know, just going back to the Tarawera that I've just run this year. So the second time doing a hundred miles at Tarawera, um, I had a completely different experience to the 2018 um, wet muddy event. And so it was, it was perfect conditions. And I just felt really happy all day. Like I found the joy again, because I'd had a couple of hundred milers in between where 
things hadn't gone so well and I'd sort of fallen apart. I finished them both, but but they weren't anywhere near the time goal that that I'd you know that I'd hoped for that I knew I was capable of. So um, four weeks ago to go out and um, and hit hit the time goal that I knew I was capable of, and just to feel it, that it wasn't. I mean, yes, it was it was hard, um, but it wasn't. I wasn't really having to push or struggle all day mentally. I, I I wanted to be there. I was yeah. I was happy. My crew were happy. Um, yeah, all all it all just sort of came together. So um, even though the the finish was um, uh, I don't know how to put it, but it was frustratingly um, exciting, I suppose. Um, it uh, yeah, <laughs> I am. Um, but yeah, I, I think I haven't mentioned this yet, but but um, I ended up coming second this year at the at the, at the hundred miler, um, and yeah, frustratingly second by eighty three seconds. So yeah, a minute and a half. Um, and I had been actually leading the race uh, most of the day, uh, and. Um, my uh, yeah, my friend uh, came came past me with about uh, 25 or 30 k's to go. Um, it was dark by that stage, so the event starts at um, three o'clock in the morning. I think we started, and so we yeah start in the pitch black and then um, and finish in the dark as well. Um, anyway, she came past me and. Uh, I knew I knew she wasn't too far behind for for a few kilometres. I could hear her behind me actually, uh, and so yeah. So to then have her go past um, was was tough, uh, but I know the course very well, so I um, I knew what was still ahead of me, and so I just kept pushing on and. I knew she, she's stronger than me on the technical terrain and, and on the hills um, and particularly on the descents. And so we had a little bit of that coming up, but then the final um, seven kilometers to the finish line is, is flat. It's um, very flat along through sulfur flats and, and around the lake front to the, the finish line. And so I knew if I still had something in me, then I could, I could, um, put my foot down through that section, which I did. She, um, I, I did one of my, yeah, um, classic run through the last aid station, not stop, and uh, just, yeah, just kept going. And uh, I think she had, she was, a, yeah, she was about um, six minutes ahead of me at that stage. And so I closed the gap by four minutes 23, if my calculations oh. are correct. Um, in that final seven kilometers, so I just needed a couple more k's. Yeah, <laughs> on <Wow>. the flat. <laughs> that's that is uh, that's awesome. And again, you, um, I, I think um, one of the things that will happen to most of us to be leading in a race is something that very few of us will ever be fortunate enough to experience. So, God bless that you have worked so hard and taken yourself to this level. These are competitive, ultra, ultra competitive, <laughs> ultra races. Can you use ultra twice in the same sentence? I think <laughs> you can, but they are, these are, these are like mega events we're talking about, you know, going back and I don't know how I let this slip, but I got to double back because we're covering so much ground. Your first hundred miler is Western States and you come in fifth place. That's completely <laughs> crazy. That's well unbelievable. <laughs> First hundred mile race at Western States. I mean, first off, that almost never happens because it's so impossibly hard to get into. But because you yeah. won your hundred K, you yeah. qualified and got into the race. So, you know, there are ways to get in from around the world and they vary a little bit. But for the most part, it's one of the toughest ultra races in the world to get into. So you cut your teeth in your first hundred mile race, Western States, and you're going fifth place. And, you know, you have that experience. And then, you know, you go... Here in this situation, when we get passed in a race, um, it doesn't matter if you're in first or in fifth or in 20th, you know, all of our instincts are either to fight them off, hold them off, or if you're surprised or you're at a low point, it's almost like, uh, I can't do this. I, I can't hold on at this pace right now. I have to let go. And then most people 
when they're in that situation, they could just sink and spiral, you know, into the black hole and they start to, you see people look behind them, which is what we always tell people not to do, but it's like, okay, is somebody coming at me for third? Can I hold on? You know, can I make the Olympic trials team? Can I make the New Zealand Olympic team? Can I, or can I hold on to the podium and win a medal in the Olympics or the world championships? And, you know, most people crack, you know, you went the other way, man. You just like dug in there. You skipped your eighth station as usual. You knew you weren't as good in the technical sparts. So you hung in there and you closed a massive gap down to 80 some odd seconds. So good on you, man. I mean, that is, Thank that's you. awesome fight right there. And you know what? The next time I'm putting my money on you. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. It has really, um, you know, even though I was, um, a little bit disappointed obviously to come second no one wants to come second um it's really sparked my um my my motivation levels to yeah to, to um to get back there next year and uh, yeah it's really it's boosted my confidence again as i said i had it you know i've had some a couple of other races that didn't go to plan and um so to to have a goodie is um one to keep definitely keep in the toolbox for yeah for what's coming up ahead yeah well, that attitude is so important, Fiona. And um, I think one one of the really poignant things you said earlier is um, ultras like life, they're, they're just lessons, they're opportunities that come at us. And, you know, sometimes our lessons that we're learning are way early in the race. Sometimes they're extremely late in the race and we learn so much about ourselves. And um, not just when we come in first, when we come in second, when we keep going, when we're weaving on the track in a 24 hour event in humid conditions and in really hot weather, and we somehow soldier on and keep going. Like these are the things that we learn, but more importantly, we have a chance to then apply those things that we learn in our future races and our future ultras. So I think that's what makes the sport so cool. You know, if you go out and you're just trying to run a really fast 10 K or a marathon or a 5 K that's awesome too, man. That's, that's freaking amazing. But like there's, there's, there's just so much more depth to ultra. And for one thing, you're out there in the world, man, you're running in these beautiful places like New Zealand or in Western States or at UTMB, you're running in the mountains, you're running on trails, you're running in the country, you're part of nature. And it's just such a different experience. And I just look forward to doing more of it myself. Yeah, I know that the, the, um, the, the location, like the, the where you are part um, always comes into my mind, into my race as well. I know wherever, wherever I am, you know, even if you feel like things aren't going so well, I just shift my focus to where I am, you know, looking out over some mountain or lake or beside the sea or yeah, just such special locations that we're so fortunate for a lot of these ultra trail events to um, take place through. So to sort of pinch yourself and think, how did I get here? And and just yeah, really appreciate where you are. And um, that can that can help lift you through to that next aid station. For sure. Well, it's, it's being in the moment, right? You know, this expression that my mom used and you use, it's, it's like one foot in front of the other. That's, that's a metaphor for life and that'll get us yeah. through anything. Um, yeah. If we are able to keep moving and sometimes we can't, sometimes we actually have to stop. Sometimes we have to take a break. Sometimes we got to change our shoes or our socks or put more clothes on or take clothes off and put something dry on or whatever it might be. But if you think of it, it's just like a reset button and you know, I'm gonna and keep going. Gonna keep yeah, going you now. You have to remember to do those things because if you um, if you just keep going and you don't do the maintenance side of it, like anything in life, if we don't go to the doctor or the dentist or take our car in for a warrant, um, things can fall apart further, you know, later down the track. So I think that's it's again that's something I've learned from experience is is just taking those few extra moments to change your socks and shoes can pay dividends for later in the race. So I think with this one being my fourth 100 mile event, I learned a lot from those those previous ones and um, was able to to use that experience this year. So, and and um, I'm pretty excited actually, coming up in, a, in four weeks time, um, I'm gonna have a chance to use the my experience from the Backyard Ultra again. It seems like it's come around quite quickly, but uh, because obviously last year with COVID, um, things changed. So 
Les um, set up this uh, satellite event, I suppose you call it, uh, called it the World Champs, but so every country that wanted to be involved had an event that ran simultaneously. And uh, we, I think we, oh yeah, we started off with 15 runners and we all started at the same time. So for New Zealand, that meant we had to start at like 1 a.m. in the morning. And uh, so that, that was quite tricky to manage. And it was also the first time I'd done this backyard ultra format, um, last person standing. And um, yeah, it was learned so much, both myself and my crew. Like the crew is, I mean, the crew, crew is always critical and um, whoever's, you know, ha having the right team around you. But it, I felt even more so in the backyard ultra because, you, you know, your eight minutes or whatever you've got, to do everything that you need to do to then be on the start line on the hour. Um, it really relies on a, a crew that can think on their feet, that knows your equipment and, the, and that knows you and, and can read, you know, read signs about what you're, you actually need. Um, and so, yeah, going back to give it another go in a few weeks time, the, the New Zealand event happens in April, you see. So, it's coming up to, well, it's our autumn, really, coming into our autumn um, season. And um, we'll be having that. And the difference will be there'll be about uh, 70 or 80 starters. And and there's a golden ticket up for grabs to go to um, Lazarus event in, um, in Tennessee, so which hopefully will be held in October. But I, I don't know, there hasn't been... I, I don't I haven't seen any word about that yet, but and yeah, whether or not we'll be traveling at that stage, who knows? Who knows what's gonna happen. So you you would you would be interested in taking that crazy ass thing on because that is just that's bonkers, man. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Like when's the last time somebody's actually finished this thing, man? It's like unbelievable. Like an official finish. Yeah, well, um, at the at the the event last year, so the World Champ event. Um, in fairness, we were all running on our our, our own local um, courses, so the courses varied quite differently. But um, the guy who ended up winning, you know, who was still out there, the last last person standing overall, was in Belgium. So he was, he was running a, a, I think, pretty flat forestry course and. Um, in Belgium, a 6.7k loop, and he was out there for something like 75 hours. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this, I mean, Courtney um, and Courtney um, and that guy. Were, yeah, I remember about like doing a hundred, doing a hundred hours. So, yeah. yeah, they were they were like helping each other, trading off each other, and then she uh, ended up winning it. I followed that. I was following it like on a Twitter feed or something, but right. Just totally, totally epic. But I meant um, Lazarus, you know, the crazy race. Um, where oh. That's that's what you're saying to get the ticket there. I don't think anybody's actually finished that thing in a couple of years now. I think. Oh, you know, are you talking about the um, the Barclay? Yes, Man. Barclay. Yeah, that's what oh, I thought okay. you were. That's what I thought Sorry. you were saying. Yeah, golden ticket was to there. No, that's no, what no, I think. No, no. Oh. Golden ticket to his backyard ultra. Ah, so, yes, gotcha. Yes. No, My bad. I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to take on the, the Barclay Marathon. <laughs> I don't I don't blame you because I want nothing to do with that race. Yeah. I would I don't care. You give me all the money. Well, no, thank you. You give yeah. me a chance to go to Western States, man. I would it'd be like a dream, a dream. I'd love to go to UTMB. Um yeah. and there's just so many great, great races. And then you know, now I have to go to Tarawera because you have that cool um, not that the belt buckles aren't cool, but whatever, what is that called again? Your little it's metal. Called toki, it's called a toki and it's, it's made out of Punamu. Punamu I love it. Yeah, I love it. I need, I need one of those. Of course, I don't have a single chance on earth of coming top five unless they give one to, if you just finish when no, you're no, three years gets, old. Every, if you do the hundred miler, oh. every, every finisher. And, um, I think it's, I think the, um, cutoff is the, maybe 30 or 35 hours. I can't okay. remember exactly, but yeah. So I'm, you've I'm got putting, every chance of getting one. I'm putting this down. It's officially going into my race calendar. So you're going to have to send me, send me the official scheduling dates and everything. New Zealand's long, but on my bucket list. So this is an easy, it's a two for one situation. You know, I'll take my son and his girlfriend down there and they could just go run off and do hikes and 
all the uh, all the beautiful New Zealand mountains yeah. and I'll and I'll go uh, get myself into trouble for 30 hours or so. But if I can come back with that with that toki, I'm I'm a happy guy because it's way cooler than a belt buckle. So I want that. I'll, I'll wear that thing all the time. I'll sleep with that thing on. Uh, yeah, true, true. I mean, I, I, it doesn't come off my neck, but, um, but I also do wear my Western States belt buckle from time to time when I, when it's a, when it's a running occasion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you, if you weren't breaking that thing out, man, I'm going to be like, wow, you need to break that thing out. I'd be like, yep. Serious bragging rights, Western States. Here we go. Yeah. I mean, so before we roll out of here, do you want to talk about like one your favorite race experience or maybe something awesome that you're like pointing towards or building towards or just anything that we haven't gotten to. We've covered a lot of ground, but just one more topic specifically, something that's near and dear to you. Sure. Sure. Um, Oh yeah. I mean, we've touched on quite a few sort of past experiences, but I guess um, things that are coming up for me this year um, actually just this weekend, I'm participating in the, um, the second edition of the IAU um, virtual global solidarity run. So they started this up um, last August was the first one um, because obviously with COVID, a lot of the events were being canceled or postponed. Um, <clears throat> IAU International Association of Ultra Runners uh, manage or coordinate a lot of the, the world champs and um, I've, yeah, been fortunate to be to a couple of the 24 hour champs. And so last year with things being <clears throat> canceled, they set up this virtual event and it's a, over a weekend, you just can pick a six hour block when, um, when you want to run. And I mean, you need to be selected by your federation by, so for us, it's Athletics New Zealand. Um, but then you can, from that, you've got sort of license to choose where, where and when to run. Um, so I did that back in August, um, and then I'm doing that again this weekend, um, coming up on Saturday. So when I did it last year, I uh, I ran on roads. I basically circumnavigated our our city, our capital city, and with a couple of other uh, women who had been chosen for the team who live here in Wellington as well, and we belong to the same athletics club. Uh, but this time. Two of us, so two of us are doing it again. We're um we're going to the track, so we we I'm um, going back on the getting back on the track and doing loops, um. So I've got that coming up, um, and so that'll be a fun morning, and um and then uh, after the backyard ultra, which I've which I just spoke about a few minutes ago, um, it's the last person standing event in April. Um, the next big goal is um is to get back on the track and uh, give the 48 hour, a 48 hour um, distance, give that a go. So uh, this idea was sparked by uh, a good friend of mine, Katie Wright, who actually came first at, the, at Tarawera this year. So she was the one who just put me at the, at the end there. Um, but as I said, we, yeah, we are good mates and she came up with the idea to do a 48 hour event here in New Zealand. We, we actually don't have one. Um, she is on a UK passport um, and me, I'm on, a, on New Zealand, a Kiwi passport. And so um, she came to me and said, do you want to have a go at the New Zealand record? I'm going to, I'm, I'm keen to give the UK record um, a crack. So I, of course, me being me, not wanting to miss an opportunity, I was like, "Yeah, sure, <laughs> sign me up." I'll so, do it. <laughs> we've uh, we've just been sort of we're working, but we're we're yeah, we're getting we're getting a bit more momentum now. We're um we found a, a race director to come on board with us, and um, we're my, my athletics club, so Wellington Scottish, are, are, are going to be the official um, sanctioning um, club for us and uh yeah we're we're going to give that a go in the at near the end of july so it'll be winter here um and the new zealand record stands at about i think it's 326 kilometers so i'm not sure what that is in miles uh 181 uh, but 190 
394 miles or something crazy like that. Right, it's, just, right. it's just bonkers, <laughs> man. It's so bonkers. 48 hours is even more bonkers. I mean, yeah. yeah you. But I always like, I love the challenge of doing something that I haven't done before, I guess. And that's, that's what I get out of these ultras. If every, everyone has been, in some ways it. has been something I haven't done before. Like right back to when I first started, like obviously I'd never run an ultra. So then it was that, or I've never run an ultra in that particular country. So I go, yeah, go for that or haven't tried that longer distance. So yeah, it sparks, it, it sparks my fire. So yeah. I absolutely love it. Well, just letting you know, you your invite is already open for you to come back on after that. So to come on and, um, you know, we could, we could even do something live. It'd be maybe fun to do something live at the track before you guys go on or something. That'd be yeah. fun to do a little live Facebook or live Instagram. And, you know, before you guys are, or even the day before, if you don't want to do it the day of, because, you know, you might want to be too focused, but yeah, it's all good. And um, you got, are you set up with sponsors and whatnot? Are you getting some people on board to help, um, you know, with the, with the endeavor? Yeah, we're just, we're just working on that at the moment. Um, we've been fortunate to, um, to, to have an offer from um, Volkswagen, v, VW. Do you, do you have Volkswagen in yes. the States? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So, um, so they're, they're coming on board. So that's, yeah, one confirmed sponsor at this stage. Um, but we're, yeah, on the eye for others. So, Fab. well, yeah, let's, <laughs> hello, hello there. As oh, I'm course. pointing, I'm pointing at the Coros Vertex watch <laughs> and I've got the Coros Explorers swag on over here and you got Tara Wera, So let's go team Coros Explorers. Time to step <laughs> up, time to sponsor Fiona. We got to make it happen. So we, we know who to talk to. So that's not going to be hard, but yeah, let's, let's cool. see what we can do. Let's put a little, put a little influence in there. Well, I have to say, what a pleasure getting to know you. So awesome. You're uh, doing some incredibly inspiring stuff. And I think not only did I enjoy, you know, learning about all your amazing race adventures, but you gave so many helpful tips for anybody out there on the mental side, on the training side, just during the race, whatever, which no doubt will uh, inspire and excite people listening to it, but also help them on the practicality side of like how to work through things out there on a race or an adventure that they're taking on. So thank you so much for sharing all this great stuff with the Run Chats audience. And as we roll out, our customary saying is we tell all our runners to keep lacing them up, to keep getting out the door, and always remember to stay in the fight. Peace out, everybody.